<laughs> uh, you really want to know, huh? I don't think this incident would have happened if it wasn't for hard liquor. <laughs> Six, we came into spring training and Davey Johnson was just like, we're going to win it all. And we kind of looked around at each other and said to ourselves, you know what? We are going to win it all this year. I mean, we knew we was going to win. We won our division. I mean, everybody in that, that, that lineup on that team, from the manager to the coaches to the pitchers. <laughs> Well, I would describe the 86 team as a team that was very confident, uh, very cocky, a bunch of bad boys. Other well, teams just thought, who do, who do these guys think they are? <laughs> we knew how to be ugly. We knew how to be raunchy. We knew how to be cold. We knew how to talk to reporters. We would intimidate them. And when we rolled into the season, we realized that nobody could touch it. The best thing about 86 was the chemistry. You had the mix of veteran players and young players, and the fucking groupies probably the best. It was the best year. I mean, that was, that was probably, of all the years, like 86 is when they peaked. Lenny Dykstra was, he was the gambler. We called him Nails. Nails is one of the coolest dudes I ever been around. I remember he used to go up to women, you could come to the game to watch me play. They called me Nails. <laughs> that was his line. Well, well, game six was so intense, I got a hit to lead off the ninth inning that if I didn't get that hit, we wouldn't, we wouldn't even be sitting here right now because we would have had to face Mike Scott in game seven. You know, I drove it high and to right, but the dome's a big yard. It was kind of weird, man. It was almost like the baseball gods like came out. They didn't get there, it just landed like a grenade. <laughs> then Mookie comes up, hits like a humpback liner, and the second baseman mistimes his jump, and next thing you know. We're celebrating. We had just won the National League Championship and we was on our way to the World Series. We're having a good time. We're drinking, you know, just yelling, you know. We're celebrating out of our mind. Because I was in the jacuzzi, in the in the world whirlpool and everything with my uniform on, drinking. It was on. We got polluted with a hammer. Champagne and sauce and more champagne. And I hate champagne. Champagne burns your eyes so bad. So we somehow made it on the bus, and then from there, the, the, the chartered plane, you know? A lot of fucking people were holding the rails, man. One step at a time. It's almost like, if you can picture, like you had one club, that club closed, then you go to the next club, then that club closed, and then the plane became the after party. The plane is in great condition. You know, it's like an ordinary flight that you would take. The only difference on this plane was we had the wives with us. Well, everybody has their seats. The manager and the brass, they're in the front, you know, in the first class area. Then in like the beginning of the plane, you have the milk drinkers. You know, like Mookie was always up at the front, minding his business. I can't think of any other milk drinkers. It's, I think it was not even plural, milk drinker. In the middle, like Mitchell was in the middle, I was in the middle. So it's kind of middle back. From the middle back, Fucking, we were a train wreck, dude. The scum bunch was um, Jesse Orozco, Doug Sis, Danny Heap. They, they had the back row of the plane. Their role was to sit back there, get drunk as ever, play cards, and, and, and make all kind of noise, big sounds, and we thought it was hilarious. Yeah, it's called fucking alcohol and drugs. It's a good energy, good combo, works well together. I, I think some of the wives got a little bit I can I say it, um, a little, I think they got excited, I guess a couple wives got excited with each other more than I guess we expected. I'm just watching this and drinking, you know, I'm 21 years old, I'm loving it. As the Mets, we did a lot of damage to stuff, man, you know, that wasn't ours. Like, seats were being ripped out. 
The middle one get broke straight down for they can play cards on it. You know, deal on the down that middle seat. It was like it was like a like a tornado just came. Crazy. I mean, just throwing pillows, throwing seats. Wives throwing up in the in the seat pockets. Well, they had to throw up what they could, you know. I mean, plane is flying and you start everything starts spinning. They couldn't just it probably was the best place for them to throw up. Because it's a pretty good ride. I mean, think about it, you're in Houston. It's not coast to coast, but it's almost coast to coast. So we had a good four hours to fuck that plane up. When the food fight started, I didn't, we didn't really know how it started. A plate of peas and mashed potatoes and stuff flies in the back. Barry Lyons was the bike up catcher. One of the guys that drinks a lot too, so we drink. You know, he's passed out with his head down. And Roger McDowell got his whole salad plate, started putting the lettuce, tomatoes, you know, onions, cucumbers, carrots on top of Barry's head. And then Roger put the salt and pepper, and I just got a fork actually eating it off the top of his head. Somebody said, hey, Roger, leave him alone. They threw a tomato or something at him. Somebody said food fight, and it's, it's on and cracking. Everybody was throwing at everybody. Yeah, <laughs> yeah guys start slinging rolls, you know, those, those rolls. You had to duck, because, you know, you had pitchers on the plane that could throw them real good. You know, they just grip them in the hand like a baseball. And, it was like, you got a duck. It was airplane food, so nobody eats airplane food. If you could have seen the wives and stuff that had cake all in their hair and everything and food and green beans and stuff, it was a mess. Nightmare on Elm Street. It was fun for us, but it was a real nightmare. When we got off, I, when we walked off that plane, I was like, oh my God, this this is insane. We're gonna tore up this whole plane. I mean, dude, like a bomb hit that fucking place. I, I just remember like jumping over shit. And, Heads up, watch out, over that seat. Wait, that's a body there. Don't worry, keep going. And I remember getting off the plane somehow, seeing the fans waiting for us. Yeah, they were at the airport. Yeah, it was awesome. We got in like, you know, what, four in the morning, three in the morning, I mean, I mean, but that's New York. Frank Cashin gave Davey a bill the next day when we were back home. I'm quite sure it was probably like over $100,000 worth of damage on the plane. When they start talking like that, I start sitting in deep back in my locker. David looked at the bill that Cash gave him to him, and he said, he balls it up and said, we just want you to fucking pen it, you pay for it. We ain't paying for it, they deserve it. They are on their way to the World Series, they have worked hard, and, and you know, they had, they had a little fun. Baseball is different now, ripping up planes and getting fucked up and being loud, and it's not typical. In, in this era now, you do some stuff like that, are you gone? You're incarcerated, and I don't care who you are. You're going to jail. Everybody's going to stay on that plane, and everybody's going to come out in handcuffs. <laughs> it could have been the best, last, best plane ride ever.